Yes, you read that title correctly. I, Comic Foil, may have failed to put out a character study in nearly two years, but I turned 2023 into my most productive year yet when it comes to playing games. Which, now that I think about it, sounds awfully non-productive. Look, I consider myself a pretty lucky guy. I have a good job that affords me expendable income, and that means I buy a lot of video games, usually on sale, that I don't get around to playing until years later. Last January, I told myself enough is enough. It's time to make a dent in that backlog. And thanks to my habit of sharing my thoughts about every game on Twitter, whether people People ask for it or not, my memories of these games are all cataloged in my brain, my heart, and most importantly, my social media. That said, I do feel like I should try to make some quote-unquote meaningful content on this channel, so I figured I'd share my many observations in a video, going through each game and talking a bit about them. It's quite a varied roster, transcending consoles, genres, and standards of quality. Maybe I'll have a few recommendations for you, or you and I will share an opinion that helps validate the time you wasted playing games last year. Lethargy loves company. Quick shout out to two creators that helped inspire this list. There's Rasputan, who does this sort of recap on a monthly basis and always has something interesting to say. And there's Daryl Talks Games, who made two videos that are particularly impactful to me about how to tackle your video game backlog and whether or not completing it is feasible or even worth pursuing. All great stuff, and I'm proud to share a media platform with them, even if that platform puts ads on videos that I'm not even collecting revenue on. Good time to mention I have a Kofi account, link in the description. Anyway, let's get started. While I had already started it in late 2022, the first credits I rolled in 2023 belonged to Nier Automata, the first in the category of you seriously never played this before. Nier's reputation precedes it. It's got robots and references to existential philosophers, both of which make good bait for a comic foil, but I never found the time for it until now. Seeing Platinum Games at the helm, I expected more of a character action game, and it took me a while to realize how much level grinding is needed to comfortably survive fights. But the story, while somewhat predictable to me, kept me hooked. <laughs> I say predictable. Maybe I'd heard too much about it already. Or maybe I know too much about the philosophers these droids are named after, but I can't say it really blew my mind. First time they mentioned the war of humans versus aliens, I turned to my partner and said, I bet all the humans are dead. These androids don't even know why they're fighting. It's just the only way they can justify their existence. But seeing that coming does little to soften the palpable gloom these realizations cause our heroes. You might know by now, Automata is made to be played multiple times. It's not a real playthrough if you only played it once. I like this game enough to get the Platinum Trophy before that final, final ending. And I have to admit, the unique way it forces finality onto the playthrough did get me. Dare I say, the best credit sequence to any game ever. Just a few days into the new year, the second game I played was a gift from my good buddy Joe, an original GBA copy of Sonic Advance 3. I'd played Sonic Advance 1 and 2 plenty of times back in the day, but for some reason skipped SA3. So I was glad to finally cross this game off of my, wait a second, something's wrong. This game feels bad. Really bad. I had a bit of a panic here. I remembered enjoying the first two advanced games, and I've never been the best at Sonic before, but I was just dying constantly. Was I misremembering the series? Were my memories seen through rose-colored glasses? I rewatched a review by Some Call Me Johnny and was relieved to see a lot of players shared my sentiment that Advance 3 just has horrible level design for a Sonic game, and I think my whole experience fell apart from there. No way I was combing these levels for Wandering Child just for the true ending. Best of luck, Amuro. Remember to write. Eager to get the taste of disappointment out of my mouth, I booted up The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles, which collects two Ace Attorney games previously only available in Japan. I played through the first one, Adventure, but wouldn't finish the duology for a few months. So for now, let me just say I enjoyed it, and I'll put a pin in there for later. This has all been describing my free time so far, but as evidenced by the rest of my channel, I also make Let's Plays, one of which was the next game I finished, The Henry Stickman Collection. If you don't know, I have a biannual tradition on this channel called Steam Sember, where I'll spend a month trying 30 games for the first time and letting viewers decide which I make into full LPs. Those that don't make the cut I often play on my own time, we'll see plenty of those later. Henry Stickman was one of the four winners, and at the time I was flabbergasted why this of all things was so popular. It's a remaster of a bunch of old Flash games, a kind of choose-your-own-adventure consisting mostly of funny ways to get your character killed. At first I didn't find it all that funny and was worried I wouldn't be able to offer any interesting commentary to what essentially was me watching Newgrounds cartoons. It was very reference-heavy, and frankly I didn't like the snarky text judging my decisions when so often the thing that worked was completely random. But my grumpiness slowly receded as I got into the swing of searching each episode for secret items and character bios, and I saw the increasing amount of effort that goes into each episode. At times, one choice will be in a five minute long, surprisingly well choreographed fight scene, just to end up with another fail screen. And not only does each episode have multiple endings, the final episode lets you choose a combination of endings from the previous two, resulting in an entire multiverse of wild possibilities, with more consistent tracking of your past choices and character relationships than most David Cage games, honestly. It's all 
all very stupid, but in a deceptively smart way. And once I realized that failures were actually a good thing that included some of the best sequences and jokes, I was having a pretty good time navigating these flowcharts of bad life choices. And here I thought you all just liked it because it was made by the Among Us guys. It takes a big man to admit he was wrong about a game, but it takes a bigger man to get 100% of that game's Steam achievements. And I'm that man. Shortly after, I rolled credits on another Let's Play, Pokemon Brilliant Diamond. I've been with Pokemon since literally the beginning, I've always played the big new releases, and was well familiar with Diamond and Pearl. But Sword and Shield, while not absolutely meritless, left me burnt out enough to avoid the other Gen 8 releases. Oscar, aka the Green Scorpion, convinced me to give the remakes a try, and we did so in my favorite way, a Nuzlocke, which made my return trip to Sinnoh more interesting. What can I say, I already love Diamond and Pearl, this is a cleaner version with some quality of life improvements. Though it is odd that they'd leave out some of the additions from Pokemon Platinum, it dawned on me in this playthrough how much Platinum did for Gen 4's story. Not just the distortion world, but little touches and dialogue that gives the characters more life. Leaves this version feeling oddly indefinitive. But I still had fun, helped in part that I was sharing the experience with my best friend, making do or die decisions against the surprisingly competitive teams of the gym leaders and Elite Four. I can see why I never got around to the post game, but it's a serviceable remake. In February, I played Lumini, a game I originally got in a charity indie game sale and later played in Steam Sember. I picked it up as something quick and easy I could play while waiting for my D&D friends to log into Discord. Not much to say about it, you control a swarm of alien insects, collecting lights, avoiding predators, growing your numbers. Kinda went in one ear and out the other, but the environment was nice. It's a vibe. Much louder in my thoughts was a release pretty important to my corner of the internet. Fire Emblem Engage. Listen, I don't want to fight, but I do have a lot of negative things to say. This is a decisive fanbase, about as divided as a Lear hair. And no, that's not one of my complaints. I think that looks kind of cool in a stupid anime way. I haven't hated post-Awakening Fire Emblem, but in my heart, Fire Emblem is really the Aleb and Tellius eras of the series. That's my Fire Emblem. Though I did really like Three Houses. Now I get what Engage is doing here. It's in part an anniversary game and is turning the series tropes up to 11, but this story did nothing for me. It's a lot of the same problems I had with Fates. Everything's so clear-cut and binary, the main character is such a special special, the countries are oddly symmetrical, and it's just too self-insert wish fulfillment for me. It's arguably really good at being that, that's just not the kind of thing I'm looking for. Unlike Fates, the story's not really trying, and those moments when it does try just make me mad. Everything with this sad excuse for a rogues gallery, how dare you try to pull an emotional re action out of me with these character deaths. I'll admit, I came in prepared to hate the story, and I did. A fair shake was not given, I don't even care. If I ever replay this game, I'll be skipping every bit of dialogue. But I might actually replay it, because gameplay-wise, it's as solid as Fire Emblem's ever been. For how much fan service hurts my enjoyment of this series, equipable summons of all past FE heroes is pretty cool. It makes for a really interesting character building system. I bet Maniac Mode is really fun once you finish some of the crazy builds made possible in this game. Just don't expect me to waste time inviting party members to watch me sleep. Again, I'm not saying it's bad, I'm saying this isn't the kind of Fire Emblem game I like. But I'm glad you like it. Go play your Yunaka loving hearts out. Oh boy, I needed a quick palate cleanser after that. Something to play idly on my Switch while Ali and I watch TV or while we're hanging out with friends. To my delight, Nintendo Switch Online added Game Boy games to its collection this year, and since I'm a simp with my Nintendo account, I might as well cross off some classics I've never beaten, including the original Kirby's Dream Land. I mean, I sorta of played it already, the first mode of Kirby Superstar is a world-for-world -world remake, but playing the OG monochrome version with bit crunch sound and no copy abilities? There's something charming about it. It's impressive how much charm they were squeezing out of the hardware even back Back then. These little cutscenes before each new world you go into, just perfect. Resources well spent. Okay, palette cleansed, next up is the other game I skipped in Gen 8, Pokemon Legends Arceus. And you know what? I loved it. This is my jam right here. A little grindy, incredibly janky, but a fresh take on the turn-based Pokemon formula. I wouldn't even say everything works about it. Not sure I like the agile mode thing, it feels like a clumsier version of Bravely Default. But I love cataloging Pokemon, I love how different challenges made me actually want to change up my team on a constant basis, I love how a lot of Pokemon get a chance to shine through certain side quests. This is the most positive I've ever felt about Burmy. And I laughed so hard at this guy who wants a Beautifly, not realizing his precious Wurmple evolved into a Cascoon on a collision course with his expectations, and I love how Arceus is actually treated like a god in this game. One you're not fit to meet unless you plan to 100% this freaking game. And a lot of the new species and regional forms are cool too. I'm a big fan of Ursaluna, though Enamorous might now be my least favorite Pokemon of all time. Is this... is this fun for people? 
Did the devs make this encounter thinking it would be fun? At this point in March, I'm on a roll with Switch JRPGs, so I move on to Live Alive. At least I think that's how it's pronounced. Personally, I like saying Live Alive better, but I'm afraid to argue with the experts. Live Alive's actually an obscure Super Nintendo game a Squaresoft hidden gem that served as an inspiration for Octopath Traveler. So with Octopath's success, they remade Live Alive in the same HD 2D style. It looks and sounds great. You play through the stories of seven heroes, well, eight, all in different time periods with little obvious connection. But unlike Octopath Traveler 1, which was otherwise a really good game, everything in Live Alive comes together in a truly satisfying way in the last act. Each story is also extremely different, and not all are created equal. I was a little worried when I finished my first scenario, The Old West, which was short and kinda gimmicky, but felt better after playing the more traditional prehistoric scenario next. The battle system is interesting, not fully a tactics game, but using a movement grid and special attacks that rely on positioning. It's rarely all that complicated, but some boss fights really put me to the test. It's a mixed bag, but one I suggest more people try. There's really nothing else like it. Except, maybe, Octopath, but even then, Live Alive is painting with its own set of brushes. I think at least everyone needs to play the ninja scenario for a few hours. It's the coolest coolest, most frustrating thing I've had to do all year. It made me feel like a ninja and cured me of ever wanting to be one again. During this time, Allie and I were re-watching The Owl House and prep for the big finale, so wanting something that I only kinda needed to pay attention to, I went back to Switch Online with Kirby's Dream Land 2. And I think I can say I've now beaten every mainline Kirby platformer? This one's a pain to 100% though. With both copy abilities and animal buddies, you have a lot of combo abilities, sort of like Kirby 64. Except in Kirby 64, most of the combos are, you know, good. Not only are a lot of moves in Dream Land 2 very stiff, getting the special collectibles often requires you getting animals to places they can't get to easily. I try not to abuse save states when playing these old games, but this one was trying my patience. Also, I was doing this exercise rule at the time where I would do jumping jacks or crunches or push-ups or something every time I died in a video game, which didn't happen much with Dream Land 2 until the final boss, which is surprisingly tough for a Kirby game outside of post-game content. A lot of jumping jacks, a lot of crunches, a lot of push-ups. Kirby helped me get yoked this year. At the same time, I was occasionally booting up Kuru 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 Rin. I've got a thing for Nintendo's forgotten first-party titles, and this was never localized, but when it showed up in the online GBA collection, I got really excited. This is that game where you pilot basically a helicopter propeller that never stops moving, and you have to navigate through tight courses. It's frustrating, but it's my kind of frustrating. I saved Kururin's whole family, and you think you're a Nintendo fan? Consider this gate kept. By mid-April, I finally finished the second of this collection, The Great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve. Heck yeah, I'm counting these as two different games, but let's talk about them together. Having never played the 3DS titles in this series, this was a bit of a leap for me in terms of mechanics, but I was happy to see the Ace Attorney formula is going strong. We get a new cast of characters here, and the charm is still intact with hilarious canned animations reminiscent of the limited GBA and DS sprite sets, and the Victorian setting lends this duology its own fresh identity in the series. Herlock Sholmes is such a creator's pet, and yes, I did pronounce his name right, but his energy is infectious. I love these segments where you have to fix his theories of what happened, and he and Ryunosuke are spinning around all anime-like, and the fact that his fingerprinting and blood sampling technology is considered unproven scientific theory at this point in history, far from damning evidence, keeps things interesting. Often you know who the culprit is thanks to Sholmes, or at least you know that somebody was at the scene of the crime, but proving it to the traditionalist court is another matter, especially when dealing with the cantankerous jury and what's probably my favorite new mechanic. Of course, as is often the case with Ace Attorney games, I'd noticed something before even the main character did, and would be waiting each for my opportunity to present the seemingly obvious answer. The games are slightly overwritten, which is why I took a break between the two. Apparently, these were originally planned to be one game before the writers discovered it was way too long and split it up, and it leads to this weird bit with a case in the second game that's retconned into happening during the events of the first game. I get why they did it for pacing reasons, it's just weird. But I like how these two games together create a whole story. Ryunosuke is a great character. He's his own flavor of adorkable attorney, and I can't wait for Herlock to propose to him. It was around this time that Ali, who's really into cozy games, got into playing them on my Steam account, using my PC in my office. Which is the reason why the most played game on my Steam account is The Sims and something called Dinkum. This game's actually kind of awesome. But anyway, I just like being in the same room as her, so for the next few weeks I spent a lot of time in the chair behind her in the office, either playing the Switch handheld or going through more Steam Sember losers on my laptop. And since I was still on a mystery kick, that next Steam Sember loser was Return of the Obra Dinn. Oh. My. God. 
why did I take so long to play this? If you don't know, this is the game where you investigate an abandoned ship. You get a book with the names of all the crew members and have to figure out how each person died, which despite having a magic stopwatch that lets you peer into the moments before a person's death, is easier said than done because you don't know what any of these people were supposed to look like. Operadin requires critical thinking in a way most mystery games don't. If you say a wrong answer in Ace Attorney, it'll deduct points, sure, but Operadin isn't even nice enough to correct you. You'll only know you're on the right track when you get three answers perfectly, meaning you can get easily lost in your own assumptions. You're really not spoon-fed anything, and that makes it extra rewarding every time you get your guesses confirmed in permanent ink. This game freaking rules. Somewhere between alley sessions of The Sims and Dinkum, I had enough time with my desktop to finish my Let's Play of Kaze and the Wild Masks, my second Steam Sember winner. Its success was largely attributed to my uncontainable joy playing something clearly inspired by Donkey Kong Country, a childhood favorite of mine. And Kaze does honor to her predecessor. The platforming controls are smooth, and the collectibles, though numerous, are fun to seek out thanks to the short levels and the well organized tracking system. Where it goes a step beyond is the titular masks. These are technically similar to DK's animal buddies, especially the eagle mask resembling a certain parrot in none too subtle thorny bramble stages. But then you got the tiger with its Mega Man X-like wall jumps, and the dragon that turns the game into a tough-as-nails runner. I don't know if this Let's Play was as fun for everybody watching it as it was for me, but there is no question in my mind that I'd be 100%ing this game from the moment I started it. With all Kaze's colorful jewels collected, I found a comfy spot on the office floor, and serenaded Alley with a bopping soundtrack from Cadence of Hyrule, Crypt of the Necrodancer featuring The Legend of Zelda. The fact this game even happened is so cool. Zelda is my favorite video game series, and I quite enjoyed the first Necrodancer game, which was more of a dungeon crawler. COH, on the other hand, is more of an open-world adventure, taking particular inspiration from A Link to the Past. It's also a lot easier than the first Necrodancer, but it's still got some intense boss fights. This one made me do a lot of crunches. I also liked playing the side modes as Skull Kid and Octavo. I might have been interested in the DLC, but it's just a tad too expensive. But overall, it's a game that sounds good and feels good. Back to my laptop, still wanting some mysteries, I started another Steam Sember loser. Aviary Attorney is set in 19th century Paris and follows J.J. Falcone, Maybe it's just Falcon, but I like saying it like Falcon. A somewhat bumbling lawyer whose only advantage is being the first law firm listed in the phone book. For you art fans, all the character portraits in this game are taken from the political cartoons of J.J. Granville, and the music is mostly compositions by Camille saint saens which firmly sets the game in its century. Gameplay-wise, you can compare this game to Ace Attorney, but I wouldn't call it one-to-one. -one. What I found most interesting was the fact that this game has no fail state. The story keeps going whether you succeed or fail each case, with consequences for failure weighing on the hero. In fact, the third case has three possible outcomes, where you either win, lose, or refuse to even participate. And this leads to three entirely different final chapters, respectfully titled Liberty, Egality, and Fraternity, the national motto of France. While the cases aren't too complex, it's actually really hard to collect enough evidence to win the third case, requiring you use your limited investigation time perfectly. I'd recommend it to Ace Attorney fans who want something similar but different. It's on the short side, but that's to its advantage. Also, it's kind of hilarious. In the first case, it's mentioned that the suspects had red herring for dinner, which later becomes a piece of evidence, that's the level of humor we're working with here. Next up, Dicey Dungeons, which I think technically qualifies as a deck-building game, and also a roguelike game. Your various attacks and items are powered by D6s, which you have to utilize as efficiently as possible to beat these baddies before they can beat you. And man, I'm having trouble finding the words, this is just a really smartly designed game from the mind of Terry Kavanaugh, same guy who made VVV, VVV, and Super Hexagon. There's six different characters, each with their own gimmicks, and each has six different missions with their own gimmicks. You're constantly having to look at the battle system in a new way. I guess I'd say it explores its own battle system more than most games do, if that makes any sense. I also love the host, Lady Luck, who has us trapped in this game show with a promise of riches but clearly controls the odds. She's horrible, hilarious, and she's giving off a lot of gender. This game's got style, it's got brains, it's got a big recommendation from me. Now there's one game that's been sitting on my backlog for more than a year at this point, No More Heroes 3, but I stubbornly insisted that I couldn't play it yet, not until I played Travis Strikes Again. So yes, I picked up this game purely so I could play another game. I can't say I had fun, per se, playing Travis Strikes Again, and that's alright. As much as I love the first two No More Heroes games, I wasn't expecting TSA to be like them. I already knew this was more of an arcadey hack and slash. The top-down view doesn't do much to make the game more exciting looking, but what makes this game interesting is the auteur theory behind it. I feel like I understood Goichi Suda a lot better from playing this. While his company Grasshopper has made a lot of games over the years of varying quality, I believe this was the first game Suda directed himself since the first No More Heroes. It's been a 
rough road for him, and I think Travis strikes again is Suda expressing some of those feelings he's had. Travis being this famous guy with a big fan base, but he can't live up to his own hype, and he's laying low trying to build up the courage to go back to what he used to do. I rolled my eyes the first time I heard that Travis would be going into video game worlds, expecting bottom-of-the-barrel self-aware gamer humor. But Suda uses this setting to get in touch with the kind of games he loves. Text-based adventures, ugly PS1 RPGs, gory pixelated messes. Most of these games are fictitious and arguably parodies of other games, but then there's this one chapter that takes place inside Shadows of the Damned, a game Suda himself produced and one of his biggest regrets, where the game's protagonist voices a lot of the compromises Suda had to make when working on it. By the end of this adventure, both Suda and Travis feel finally ready to tackle that third entry in the No More Heroes trilogy. I certainly was. But that would have to wait a little longer because now it was May and a serious bomb was about to drop. This was the big one. I planned my week, to some extent my year, around The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. I knew it was going to take time, but what I didn't know was that this game would exceed my wildest expectations for it. Now I really love Breath of the Wild. I look at it as a bit of an experiment, and I love how it really is open world to an almost anarchic degree. But as a Zelda fan, there were things Breath of the Wild sorely lacked for me. And it's kind of amazing how Tears of the Kingdom improves just about every aspect of its predecessor. Maybe not to perfection, but to the point where you arguably could just skip the former. That said, I still like having played the former. It gave this Hyrule a sense of familiarity while the upheaval still kept it from being like a straight repeat. Some players didn't like weapon durability in the first one, but Nintendo stuck to their guns, bolstering it with the fuse ability that encourages the attitude of making do with what you have. The sheer versatility of Ultra Hand is astounding, and while Ascend and Rewind feel like they would break the game, the devs are confident enough to let you break the rules when you want to. You're constantly getting off track with side quests and rabbit holes in the sheer vastness of the abyss, but it always feels like time well spent, and often you're rewarded not just with paltry weapons and Korok seeds, but entirely new aspects of the game that push the scope even further than you expected. The enemy variety is expanded, the bosses are better, the dungeons… We have real dungeons with their own distinct look and feel. BOTW felt like it took place after the most interesting parts of its story, but TOTK casually executes an emotional twist I didn't think a Zelda game would ever reach for. Holy frickin' Light Dragons, they nailed it! The Mad Lads nailed it! It was four weeks before I wanted to do anything else with my free time. I could go on, but suffice to say, it made me very happy. Maybe a bit too happy. So after four weeks, I decided to play a real bummer. Look, I knew all about The Last of Us already. I knew how it ended. I'd seen all the big scenes. I just never played it for myself. Gameplay-wise, I don't have a ton to say. I've learned to love the Uncharted style of game. Everything here worked fine, even if sneaking around clickers took some getting used to. And I know we can get tired of seeing this franchise everywhere. Naughty Dog really needs to stop remaking the same two games. And there's a lot of bait posts online overpraising the series. But honestly, I think The Last of Us is a great story excellently executed. And the fact that it's a game is used to enhance that story in dozens of smart ways, hiding Joel and Ellie's character development inside minute actions and prompts. Despite everything I'd heard about it, this game lived up to the hype for me. And while I'm at it, the HBO show was pretty great too. I still prefer the game as the best way to experience the story, but the adaptation does things to be its own kind of special. I know part two is extremely divisive, I'll probably get to playing that this year. But here in June 2023, there was an even older game I had to get off my backlog, an obscure title you might have heard of called Final Fantasy VII? Again, I knew every plot point ahead of time. Everything that could be spoiled for me was spoiled for me. I knew Aerith was a sword holder, I knew Cloud was acting, I knew Ket Shi was a spy, and I don't care what Square says, I'm saying Ket Shi, that's the name in myth, I'm very cultured. Still, there's nothing like playing the game for yourself. I don't have time to say everything I want to, that's the case for all these games I'm talking about today, but even knowing where the story is going, FF7 really was a game ahead of its time that tackles more themes more well than most games. That's a sentence I just said. It's a story about loving yourself, loving the world, and hating billionaires. I've been a ride-or-die Final Fantasy VI boy for 15 years, but dang it, Final Fantasy VII's just as good. The haters were wrong. I am glad I had speed up, though. And from there, I jumped right into the remake. But there'd be another five small games I'd beat in the meantime, so let's talk about those first. Like Gato Robato. You're a little cat in a little mech suit, and you're so cute. Sometimes you have to leave the suit to go into smaller places, and sometimes you get different kinds of mechs. It's an adorable Metroidvania you can complete in three hours with a little elbow grease, and it makes a good speedrunning game. After that was Triangle Strategy. Uh, did I say these were five small games? 
So I guess I should explain a bit more how I play games, because I'm rarely playing just one in a weekly span. Not counting my Let's Plays, which I usually schedule, I usually have around three games going at a time. One on my PS4, one on my Switch, and one on my PC. So on any given evening, I play whichever console is most convenient at the time. Depending on if Ali's using the TV, if we're hanging out in another room, if we're away somewhere for the weekend, etc. I actually started Triangle Strategy around the same time as The Last of Us, but played mostly exclusively in handheld mode, a lot of times reading dialogue in bed before going to sleep. There's a lot of dialogue in this game, and really cut into my Discworld time. But that's part of the strength of Triangle Strategy. It really is a lush, realized world, with a lot of that geopolitical intrigue I love so much about Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn. But as a tactical RPG, it has more in common with Final Fantasy Tactics. Missions can be tough, but it helps that there's no permadeath, so you can make sacrifice plays with your guardsmen or send your invisible rogue out much more readily. There's a lot of unique characters who are all good in their own unique way, and while you pretty much have to grind the tavern missions to keep up with the story, the skills you get feel rewarding. The story, like I said, is rich, and it's got a really cool system where the group votes on actions that affect the course of the story. The first time you play, I recommend just going with your heart and trying to influence your advisors to vote with you. And your social stats increase as you play, so in New Game Plus you can just strong-arm people into your way of thinking, even if you aren't careful about your argument. So it's easier than to try other paths. Though I only made time for one playthrough. I didn't have it in me for two runs in a row. I would like to try a second playthrough sometime, though. Maybe as a Let's Play? Maybe with Oscar? Maybe Oscar's totally blind and I laugh at him while the world crumbles around him? Let me know if that sounds fun. I think it sounds fun. Next up, a blast from my past. Pokemon trading card game. The game. I actually had this on the Game Boy in the 90s, but lost my copy before I could beat the game. It's one of the few physical possessions in my life I've failed to hoard like a greedy dragon, so I was stoked to see it hit Switch Online. With the natural power creep and the Pokemon TCG, all TCGs really, there's something nice about slipping into the meta back when there were only three booster sets. And being two decades smarter, I knew how to run the table. Hitmonchan, Electabuzz, Profit. The Elite Four is still pretty tough though, especially with their broken AF promo cards. Wizards, please nerf. And Nintendo, make another one of these, just with the current cards or some of the current cards. This is such a cool concept, I'll learn the new meta, I promise. And with that, suddenly, it was the end of summer. Where did it go? In late August, I decided to hold on to that tropical feel with Yoku's Island Express. Steam Simber watchers might remember this as the Metroidvania pinball mashup, which is a really neat idea. While the adventures of this little dung beetle were very cute, I have to admit, by the end of my five-hour playthrough, the novelty had run thin. There's cleverness to be sure, but eventually there just aren't enough different ideas going around here. The world is just interconnected pinball tables. And sometimes I just wished I could get someplace faster, meaning I was no longer enjoying the game's main mechanic. Part of me wanted to hunt down some extra items and side quests, but traversal had just become too daunting and navigation too confusing. Maybe a sequel could exist where Yoku unlocks new abilities over time that complement the pinball movement, but as is, this is just a good idea, not a great game. But hey, that's just my opinion, and I'm the guy who decided to play Kirby's Avalanche next even though I don't like Puyo Puyo. It was time for another game I could be alright playing in handheld with low volume, and Kirby hadn't steered me wrong yet. I do like games like this, like Tetris and Panel de Pond, but Puyo Puyo's just never been one of my games. I suppose I'm better at it now after playing this. Really, I'm just fortunate there's unlimited continues and I can retry these 13 levels until I lucked out. This game remains notable for one reason, though. It's the only game, to my knowledge, where Kirby speaks full sentences. And he's trash-talking everybody. This is so hilariously out of character, I'm glad I played it just for that. But alright, alright, about Final Fantasy VII Remake. Now, as a FF7 purist as of one month earlier, two of my initial reservations were quickly put to the test. Why can't this be a turn-based RPG, but it works well as an action RPG, and once you get out of the early stages, the combat system really opens up and gets pretty deep. Also, how can you sell this at full price if it's only one-third of the original story? Rest assured, this is a full-size game that builds a satisfying arc within the original Midgar chapter of the tale. The added depth with the Avalanche team, the wall market bigwigs, Reno and Rude, all show these writers understand the themes of the original game, and they especially understand the characters. Heck, I think part of why FF7 is called overrated so often is the damage done by Fallout follow-ups like Advent Children that flanderize these characters. But Remake really gets them. Cloud isn't just some emo guy, Aerith's not the perfect vision of angelic purity, Barrett does more than swear. These are larger than life, but very nuanced characters. The game also looks amazing, and did a great job making designs both recognizable from the PS1 days, but quite a bit spiffier. If I had to complain, well, I have some issues with the Whisper of Fate. Like, I really hope we're done with them at the end of this game. Too often, the hero's victories were actually being attributed to these strange specters trying to maintain 
maintain the original timeline or whatever. It kind of takes everybody's agency out of this, which I know is the point that they're fighting to get their agency, but like, I get it. We broke our chains, let's move on. And personal thing, but this game is just a bit bloated. Five minute segments in the original have become hour long dungeons, and I didn't need all of these side quests, especially when walking is so slow and the fast travel options are so limited. Midgar is a really interesting setting that was worth fleshing out and further exploring. Professor Hojo's underground lab, not as much. I didn't need to spend two hours here. But where this game is good, it's amazing. Anyway, I'm really looking forward to Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which I'll no doubt be playing as soon as I get a PS5 three years from now. I knew I needed another short retro game to squeeze in before the next big release, so I picked up Gunstar Heroes. I played this Genesis classic a lot back on the Wii Virtual Console. I'd just never beaten it until now. It really is a great shoot-em-up. Cool weapons, notable bosses. I wish it ran better because it'd be a great co-op game if it weren't for the poor performance when too many characters are on screen. Maybe Sega will give this a bona fide remake or remaster sometime because I'd love to actually play through this with a friend. You know, without the game strobing for dear life. For now, it was a nice revisit, just before the real game of the year came out. I love Pikmin. I can remember earlier this same year saying how it felt like Pikmin 4 would never come out, but the Nintendo gods were benevolent and this fourth entry lived up to my own lofty expectations. All the Pikmin types are here in one game, except for the bold men and the weird mushroom men, but who's really counting those? And the new Pikmin are adorable. We got caves a la Pikmin 2, there's a day limited Olimar mode a la Pikmin 1, there's brain busting challenges a la Pikmin 3 that test your powers of multitasking, or should I say, Dandori, and Ochi, he's such a good boy. At at first I worried he might be overpowered and steal the spotlight away from the Pikmin, especially because the tutorial teaches you more about him before it teaches you about the Pikmin, but he's an iconic tool that makes the game so much more manageable and I really couldn't imagine it without. And how about those hectic night missions? It really is a best of all three previous games, polished to a beautiful sheen and topped off with new ideas that pretty much all work. My only regret? Clearly Olimar is important to me and it hurts me a little bit to see the series seemingly retcon certain events of the series, but who cares about Pikmin lore anyway? Literally only me. And once I accepted this as a soft reboot, I felt a lot better. I stand by my old character study, but this is a new age now. One full of dogs and Dendori. We Pikmin fans don't get fed too often, you won't hear me complaining. Ready for more sleuthing, I return to my Steam Sember roster to play Jenny LeClue Detective Vu. What a cool premise for an adventure game. Jenny is a Nancy Drew-esque girl detective in a fictitious book series by one Arthur K. Finkelstein. But when the series begins to tank, Arthur's publisher forces him to make the next book more adult, more true crime. So in the world of the book, we follow Jenny LeClue, who goes from finding missing glasses to solving an actual murder case. All the while narrated by the writer, who feels like he himself is letting the characters down by introducing this narrative darkness. That is so captivating, and at times the writing really shines. There are some people for whom this will be their favorite indie game ever, but I have to say the tone still trends a bit too young for my taste. As a hardened armchair detective myself, Jenny's cases didn't confound me so much as they slowed me down with the occasional obtuse environmental puzzle. It also ends on a rather abrupt cliffhanger, and as of yet no sequel is announced. But I hope the dev gives this another go. I think with the lessons learned from this first title, this could be a series to rival Professor Layton and Phoenix Wright. Heck, some of you might even prefer it as is. If you want to get a feel for the tone and see if you would like it, watch my Steam Sember episode about it. Unfortunately, I couldn't help help but walk away disappointed. A disappointment I carried into another game I've been due to try for ages, A Hat in Time. And don't get me wrong, A Hat in Time really is great. Had I played this when it first came out, pre-Mario Odyssey, when we really were starving for 3D platformers, I probably would have loved this game. It also doesn't help that all of Hat's best segments, from the train car murder to the surprise horror segment to the funny mafia guys, had long since been spoiled for me. Occupational hazard for someone who writes about video games on YouTube. But this is one where I think I really would have liked the magic of a blind first playthrough. As such, I really appreciate A Hat in Time for its tight controls and inventive world gimmicks. I just didn't enjoy it as much as I'd been trained to expect. I did get both DLC chapters though, and they were pretty cool. Well, Nyakuza Metro was cool. Seal the Deal was cute, but also highly frustrating. With the best surprises spoiled for me, I guess the only ones left were the negatives that most reviewers didn't feel were worth talking about. But to me, were now horrible highlights because they were the only thing I hadn't expected. How about this dive though? It's so zippy. They actually beat Mario Odyssey to the punch on this one. I will say I like Mario Odyssey a lot better, but both games are highly worth playing. Ugh, I think I fell into a kind of cynical rut around October, which is also when I tackled my last mystery game of the year. I'd solved the case of Professor Killings, the case of the Oberdin, the case of Louis XIV, and the case of Dean Stroudsbury. All that was left to solve was the murder of Sonic the Hedgehog. Poor guy, Advance 3 really caught up with him.
So this is just a silly visual novel Sega released on April Fool's Day for free. The best part of it was the trailer where we saw Sonic dead, but in actuality this is all a pretend murder mystery party for Andy Rose's birthday. The stakes stayed pretty low for most of the game. Despite its efforts, the game didn't really make me laugh outside of, well, this frame. But there's definitely a lot of charm to the writing. You can really see the influence of the IDW comics in here. The cast is at their most likable. Knuckles has a short fuse, Blaze is brutally direct, Shadow has mellowed out but still signs his name Ultimate Life Form, and Sonic's optimism in the face of danger reminds me why I like this character in the first place. It's refreshingly wholesome in a series surrounded by a lot of criticism. Though I do think it's weird that Cream the Rabbit doesn't show up. Like, really Amy? You didn't invite Cream to your birthday party? It's not like anybody's drinking alcohol here. And she was on your team at Sonic Heroes. It's just a weird omission. Being a mystery fan, I really can't say much for the actual murder mystery. It's pretty meh. In fact, it's often sidelined for this little runner game. Like, doing this is more pivotal to progression than proving your comprehension of the case at hand. I find that a little insulting, but whatever, it's fine. How could I get mad over a free two-hour game? Beleaguered by games that, while good, still managed to disappoint me, I finally made my way back to No More Heroes 3 with a heart full of fear that I would absolutely hate it. And while, no, it wasn't the follow-up to No More Heroes 2 I've wanted for the past ten years, my time with Travis Strikes Again had prepared me to accept the game on its own terms, and accept that Suda51 was going to make the game he wanted whether I liked it or not. Honestly, I think I made the right move waiting to play Travis Strikes Again, and I recommend you do the same if you want any hope of appreciating No More Heroes 3. Combat-wise, 3 plays a lot like Travis Strikes Again, just with a more dynamic camera, which actually makes all the difference. This feels pretty good. From the first trailer of this game, I, like many other fans, was a bit disappointed by the alien motif. These abstract designs are are, to me, far less exciting than the colorful human psychopaths we cross swords with in the past. But fortunately, most of the fights turn out to be more interesting than they first appear. They kind of remind me of pro wrestling with their affinity for copious surprise entrances of characters you weren't expecting. And unlike the first two games, the main villains are people that you actually get to know over the course of the story, not last minute face reveals. We're back to the empty open world of No More Heroes 1 rather than the streamlined No More Heroes 2 map, which isn't exactly fun, but does drive home the feeling that Travis his assassin lifestyle isn't as cool as we'd like to believe. I wish I was more able to recognize all of the Grasshopper game cameos. They seem to be forming some kind of interconnected Sudaverse. And you can tell this game had a small budget, but I don't know, I think it was the game that Suda wanted to make. I didn't hate it. Now that I was in a more artsy mindset, I took advantage of my PS Plus account and downloaded What Remains of Edith Finch. It's a walking simulator, and a darn good one. It tells the story of a family that's supposedly cursed. Six generations of accident-prone Finches is told through a series of unique playable segments, as well as detailed and often very subtle environment design. I really want some of my friends to play it so I can talk about it with them, because I have some interpretations. Some of the playable vignettes are very short, some of them are impactful in this way, some of them are, I don't know, didn't do it for me. But the best of the batch is probably this section about the cannery worker who's daydreaming of a more exciting life. Also, I have to highlight this section about the baby that makes me sick to my stomach. I don't think I've ever felt a bigger sense of dread in a game I actually enjoyed. The good news is I think I got out of the dumps at this point and was back to enjoying what I was playing more often. You might call it a walking simulator. I I call it a palate cleanser. I don't remember where I first heard of Vernal Edge. It might have been Benjamage on Twitter, but something about its pixel art made me want to buy it on launch, and I finally played it in September. It's a humble little 2D Metroidvania with emphasis on combat. I love how fights feel in this game. Many enemies have super armor until you manage to break their poise meter with heavy attacks, which kind of reminds me of a FromSoft game. And you can heal yourself in the heat of battle if you find a safe place to stand for a couple seconds, kind of like Hollow Knight. Except first you have to land these pulse moves. Plus there's a ton of collectible spells. There's not a ton of enemy types, but there's there's enough here to feel good, and the late game bosses really test your mastery of the system. It's also a classic where do I go kind of game. I got stuck a lot. The world's divided into all these floating islands, so sometimes you don't know where you need to go to get the next tool you need to get the tool after that. And this game doesn't have a big community yet, so advice online was limited. I'm not used to this happening very much this day and age, but that made it really rewarding every time I made a breakthrough all on my own and got a new traversal ability. Also, Oscar came over one time while I was playing it and he fell in love. Ended up buying his own copy and 100%ing it, which gave the game a sort of second life in my mind as I talked about it with him. I'd love to see this game get more exposure. But you know what video game series really doesn't get enough exposure? Mario. My time playing Super Mario Wonder feels like a blur. I'm a Nintendo stan, I knew I would play this, but I didn't think I was all that hyped for it. Playing through it, it was as solid as any 2D Mario. The use of Wonder Seeds mixing up the levels is pretty creative. Not mind-blowingly creative like in Mario Galaxy, but the kind of creative that makes each level feel special. Certainly more special than the five new Super Mario Brothers releases that came before it. 
it. I didn't think it was knocking my socks off or anything, but over two weeks I played this game pretty much every minute I had available until I'd 100%ed it. The game is just really good, mostly thanks to a lot of little changes that make a big difference. Tiny bits of self-expression with the character choices and equipable medals, making stronger characters like Yoshi and Nabbit as a stand-in for some kind of easy mode, some gloriously stupid medals that make you run like a maniac or jump non-stop if you equip them, and I actually really love the online features. I had a lot of positive interactions being saved by people I'll never meet again, or pointing out a hidden nook with purple coins in it. It may not be surprising that Nintendo made another good Mario game, but it's very casually the best 2D Mario game in the past 20 years. Speaking of Mario, so there's two entries on this list I'm being generous by including. Normally I wouldn't count DLC as its own game, and I wasn't planning to with the Mario Kart 8 Booster Course Pass, which has been adding content to MK8 Deluxe over the last two years. But upon playing the last wave of tracks, I was surprised by an all-new credit sequence, and I thought, why not? It's certainly as big as a full game. It's as big as Mario Kart 8 Deluxe was when it first released. They literally doubled the number of tracks, and personally, I don't think there are any improvements worth making to Mario Kart at this time. So I prefer this content pack over a whole new game fixing what's not broken. At first I was worried these new tracks wouldn't match the graphical quality of the existing 48, it's hard to compete with Big Blue. But what we have here is a great hodgepodge of returning tracks from MK's long history, with a few newbies added in. It's also largely an excuse for Nintendo to reuse assets for Mario Kart Tour, and I'm just happy to see these courses in a good game. The real-world city levels take some getting used to with how they change each lap, so having them in every new cup is a bit of a pain. And all around, I think they could have done a little bit better polishing up these textures. I don't blame anyone who didn't want to shell out the money for this standalone, or buy the new premium Switch Online bundle, which is honestly way overpriced. Here's my life hack for you. Make a family plan with seven other friends and split the cost eight ways. Much more manageable, and it's worth it for me because MK8's always a go-to game whenever people are over. The new characters are just icing on the cake, and sure there's still some tracks I would have liked to see added, how Toad Circuit made the cut but Airship Fortress didn't and I will never understand, but isn't it just the human condition to always want more? With October being the spooky month, I'd picked a spooky retro game to fill time. Castlevania Bloodlines. I actually haven't played all that many Castlevania games, and my favorite ones are from the 16-bit era, but I never tried the Genesis exclusive Bloodlines before. I actually didn't know for a while if I finished this one. It's very unforgiving and light on continues. And is it just me, or are there fewer hidden healing items than usual? I don't like to abuse save states, even in unfair retro games, and for a while I used them only between levels at the password screen, basically using them to save time restarting as if I had put in the password. But the last gauntlet of bosses proved too much and I cracked. At least I didn't rewind every single mistake, but I did effectively give myself infinite lives. Feels shady, but I'd rather beat the game with an asterisk than just give up. Like Eric Lacard here, I'm no chosen one. Just a normal guy using a fancy tool to get the job done. Gotta say I love the World War I era setting. I don't even mind not having the fluid movement of Simon in Castlevania 4. I kinda like having to learn your way around the more stiff controls. For the most part, levels are doable if you take the time to learn them. But in the year of our lore 2023, I'd like more lives, please. But Pat would tell me Castlevania isn't scary enough for Halloween, and he'd be right. He'd wanted to come back to the channel for a while now, so in October, we decided to let's play a horror game. Fatal Frame, Mask of the Lunar Eclipse. We tried playing the first Fatal Frame years ago and found it was more frustrating than fun. For us or anybody who would have been watching. This title certainly has quality of life, and pardon me for this because I'm not a guy who plays a lot of horror games. I don't like horror games, I'm scared enough every day as is. But I don't think Lunar Eclipse is a good horror game. Like, I'm relieved it's not scary, but... Shouldn't it be scary? I don't just mean the arcadey photography gameplay. The flashing scores on screen maybe clash with the tone a bit, but overall I like the idea. You get more points if you keep a level head and let the ghost get close. That's a really smart way of forcing the player to confront their fears, and it's always worked in this series from what I can tell. But while the atmosphere is fittingly morose, I quickly stopped being affected by the scares. If anything, I was afraid I'd have to redo these cheap fights again, which aren't even that hard, they're just cheap sometimes. Nitro Rad puts it really well in his video. Rather than design curated scary moments around the gameplay, the devs always default to taking control away from you and playing a dramatic sound. In his words, it's the horror equivalent of a laugh track in a sitcom. It feels very cheap. Nitro Rat also said this was the easiest game in the series, though, and I was still dying a lot, so take that for what you will. And I appreciate the better sense of direction, but maybe they overcorrected this problem because I just felt like I was going through the motions from place to place. Was this Let's Play even good? I kinda think it wasn't. Its views were garbage for my channel. I don't know. People who actually like horror games comment below. Is Fatal Frame bad or am I just a hater? 
Oh no, I forgot about this one. This game's not gonna do any better. Star Fox Zero. I got this for Christmas ten months prior just for collector's purposes, and it sat collecting dust for far too long. I couldn't ignore it another day. First, the obvious. The gimmicky Wii U controls suck. Well, more accurately, they're unintuitive. I liken it to Kid Icarus Uprising. It's kind of wonky to learn, but you can learn it. Only difference is, I think Kid Icarus is a great game worth mastering. Past the learning curve, there's a lot of great stuff about it. Star Fox Zero feels like a monkey's paw. Fans kept saying adventure and Assault and Command weren't good, they should just make a game like Star Fox 64. So they did. Miyamoto, no, you remade the wrong part. I wanted the same kind of gameplay in a new story, not the same story and completely messed up gameplay. Heck, this might be my nostalgia goggles, but I think the story's actually done better in the 64 title. It's hokey, but there's ebbs and flows to the dialogue. Here it feels like they were afraid to make Falco too arrogant or Slippy too whiny, like they were worried about the memes coming back, which didn't stop them with Peppy. It's a shame, because I love how this game looks, and doing some research online, there's some really cool secret routes in these missions. But this stupid gamepad gimmick, I don't want to play it for another second. I really, really tried to like this, but the reviews were right. Probably the worst game I played all year, and for the most tragic, avoidable reasons. I needed another palate cleanser after that, so I went back to my Steam Sember pile and dusted off another indie title, Over the Alps. I guess you can call it a visual novel, kind of light on the visuals. The story follows British secret agent Smith on a mission in 1940 Switzerland, told entirely in the form of postcards. By choosing stamps, you're able to decide how Smith responds in certain situations. You could be stalwart and chivalrous, jokingly evasive, aggressively aloof. You could really paint your own Smith here, and while there's a somewhat linear path through the game, how the tale unfolds is surprisingly open. Judging by the achievements, there's a lot I didn't see on my first playthrough. I especially like the heat system. If you're too conspicuous, these demerits pile up that get the Swiss police on your tail. But you can also find ways to throw them off your trail and buy time. And there's these trial moments that at first I thought I had bad luck guessing what to do, but it turns out there's an invisible stat system that determines success. So if you've been choosing the charming response often, you're more likely to succeed on the charming option here, and that's pretty cool. There's a second story here with another secret agent that I also played, and plans for a third story, but it's been a few years now. Is this still happening? I hope so. I'd gladly sink another three hours into this game. It's incredibly charming itself. If you like games that are like books, then this is a book game for you. With just two months left in the year, I asked myself, is there a game I can't stand to put off any longer? The universe had spoken, and I suited up for Outer Wilds. A lot of reviewers I really like, really like this game. And let me tell you something, I don't blame games like A Hat in Time when they don't reach my atmospheric expectations. It's my own fault for waiting so long and learning so much beforehand. Or maybe it's no one's fault and it's just a part of life. But when you've heard a game is a life-changing experience, and you play it, and it's actually a life-changing experience, Dang, man. This is why I do this. I thought I was done with mysteries this year, but the mystery of what the frick is wrong with our sun was possibly the most compelling yet. The whole solar system is one big puzzle box, and the only thing barring your path is your initial lack of knowledge on the game's mechanics. It's like a Metroidvania, but instead of traveling to the sand world to get a new beam weapon that lets you defeat those nightmare fuel anglerfish, you travel to the sand world and happen upon an old book that says, hey, did you know anglerfish are XYZ? And you realize, oh, I know how to get past the anglerfish now. It's certainly daunting at first, and the game does little to point you in the right direction. That's something I really appreciate in a game like this, kind of like Oprah Din. But here's my advice if you try to play it and find yourself overwhelmed. Most importantly, the ship's computer is your friend. If you read a data log that had a clue in it, but you didn't realize it was a clue, it's on here. And you can use this flowchart as inspiration for where to search next. But also, feel free to just explore whatever catches your fancy. If something looks interesting, it probably is. And as a third option, don't be afraid to just vibe out. Find a place to park or float or take in the sights. There's no rush. The end of the universe will wait, believe it or not. Sage wisdom aside, I was not ready for this ending sequence. Is someone chopping onions in this spacesuit? I am floored. Another game I've put off for too long, Chrono Cross. The original Chrono Trigger is one of my favorite games of all time, after all. And though I've heard this indirect sequel is messy, I always wanted to try it myself. So I was overjoyed to see when it was ported to the Switch. It's, um... Well, it's interesting. I've never seen a sequel that feels so far removed from its first entry, yet absolutely requires you know the first entry for the plot to make any sense. It helps that the Chrono Trigger I know best is the DS version, which, like the PS1 version, has a few added story elements to tie in better with Chrono Cross. So I could be like, oh, it's that baby. I remember that baby. Right off the bat, I'll tell you one thing Chrono Trigger does a lot better, having a balanced cast of party members. Cross has enough to fill a Fire Emblem game, and admittedly they're fun to collect, but they also aren't all created equal. 
neither in stats nor in plot significance. Also, funny story, I used a guide just to recruit as many people as I could on my first go, and two characters I really wanted required me to distance myself from this character, Kid. Kid's kind of important. A lot of the impact of the late game assumes you've grown to care about her, which... Whoops. Sorry kid, I just really wanted to get Glenn in my first go. Dude has two swords. The battle system is very technical, but once you wrap your head around it, it can be a lot of fun. It's got that kind of thing where a boss seems insurmountable, but if you come at it from the right angle, you can beat it way earlier level than you should be able to. And levels for that matter are tied to how many bosses you've defeated, so it's more based on progression than any form of level grinding. That's pretty cool, it makes me feel like I'm always at the level of difficulty I'm supposed to be at. And yeah, the game is incredibly beautiful, but it's also a mess. A beautiful mess. I'm feeling a lot of things here, but none of them are disappointing. That's not all though, the Switch port of Chrono Cross was also nice enough to include Radical Dreamers. For the uninitiated, Radical Dreamers is a visual novel by series director Masato Kato, originally meant to tie up loose plot threads from Chrono Trigger. It ended up serving as an inspiration for Chrono Cross. It's not technically canon to the story of Chrono Cross, except maybe it happened in another timeline or something like that. Mostly it's just cool to see things that would later show up in Chrono Cross in their original conceptual form complete with Surge and Kid as the main characters. And I'd say this deepened my appreciation for Chrono Cross. Certainly made me like Kid more. On its own, it's a darn good visual novel, with a vintage Dungeons & Dragons feel to the adventure. Kudos to the localizers, the writing here evokes some pretty effective horror. Fatal Frame, eat your heart out. If I had one complaint, it's the repetition of certain random encounters. These pop up when you're going down hallways, and they're fine tests for the first time. But the answers to how to defeat them without taking damage are never going to change, so I don't see the point. There's also parts where time is of the essence, and you're penalized for not responding fast enough, and as a dyslexic person I find that very rude. You can die in this game, you have an invisible health bar, and there are even things that can heal you at the time, but it's interesting to have a visual novel that you can actually fail to beat. Or are most visual novels like that, I really haven't played that many. But really, this was a cult classic game on the Japanese-only broadcast Satellaview. Just playing an officially licensed version of this is a dream come true. A radical dream come true. Yeah, yeah, okay, hang in there. We only have five more to go. Here's the other game I was generous to call a game I beat. In this case, the game part isn't the problem. But how exactly do you beat Suica game? Answer? You get the watermelon. Look, I spent way too much time playing this to not include it. The puzzle sensation sweeping the nation, I have to admire how bare bones it is. One mode and a leaderboard, if you're lucky a limited time seasonal overlay. This feels like a $3 title, which is what they sell it for, so I'm all good. It's kind of a perfect Tetris-like. It's second nature at a glance, I'm sure even a caveman could understand matching fruit makes bigger fruit. But the skill comes in little strategies that are hard to put into words, and understanding that the game has physics, it's just not the physics we have here on Earth. The limited space means there's an upper limit to what you can fit in there, you're gonna lose eventually, but the max possible score is an asymptote. Feels like there's a limit to it, but we don't know what that limit is. Well, at least that's what I thought. I've recently heard of a mechanic that happens if you get two watermelons, and yeah, I can see how people are getting those 12,000 point scores now. Ugh, man, I suck, I've barely passed 3,000, but it always feels like I could have done just a bit better, even with the RNG. This also became an unexpected party game in my circle of friends. I kid you not, a dozen people on New Year's Eve watching one person stack oranges, cheering them on and yelling KISS when they're just a rhyme's width apart. You ever see that Star Trek The Next Generation episode where everyone on the Enterprise gets zombified by a serotonin producing VR game? I'm convinced this is that game. Four more games to go, so let me take this chance to acknowledge the two games that most defined my year as a constant presence. Those would be the last two Steam Sember winners from 2022. The last two Let's Plays on this list, and technically I'm still playing both of them for post-game at the time of recording this, but I wrote credits on them in 23, so they count. First off, Bug Fables, The Everlasting Sapling, which I was lucky enough to share with Oscar. Clearly inspired by the first two Paper Mario games, the latter of which is another game of all time for me, so take this as the praise that it is, Bug Fables is not only worthy but in some ways better than those titles. I'm not saying Thousand Year Door isn't worth playing, don't skip that remake, but in terms of giving the player just everything, Bug Fables is a true labor of love. The three-character battle system is a neat spin on Paper Mario's formula, the medals lend themselves to a lot of different big brain builds, and you'll need to master both because the boss fights don't hold back. Bagaria is such a cool world, and I think Bug Fables' greatest asset is the side content. I had a similar thought in Tears of the Kingdom, that not only is there variety and things to do, but in the rewards you get, 
get. You often stumble upon something that adds a new dimension to the entire game. For instance, Oscar and I accepted a side quest that leads to a unique mini-boss. Awesome. But beating that boss rewards you with access to a secret underground bar. From here you can spend rare collectibles on metals, find out more about the legendary bounty monsters, buy a certain rare cooking ingredient, and talking to this lady introduces an entire trading card game where you can build a deck out of enemies you've encountered and eventually compete in a big Yu-Gi-Oh tournament on a luxurious island that is itself entirely optional and has three different ways to access depending on how long you want to wait and how many berries you're willing to pay to go there. You're telling me I would have missed all of this if I didn't do side quests? Quests and rewards constantly feed into each other in a beautiful spider web of exploration. Pun freaking intended. And the three main characters are amazing and I can't decide who my favorite is. It was going to be Kabu, but then we started wrecking shop with V, and Leaf is the perfect deadpan straight man that can freeze your enemies solid. Also, also, the soundtrack rules. Also, 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 watch our Let's Play. And if you're subscribed to me already, you know the other game that defined my year was CrossCode, not to be confused with Chrono Cross. This one I handled alone, so rather than Oscar, this was an experience I shared with, well, you guys. Crosscode is a very complicated game, and frankly I sucked at it at first. I got some tips from my bud Zafer Revolution who gifted me the game, but I also learned and grew from advice in the comments. It was a difficult, often humbling experience. Crosscode asks a lot of you. Equipment preparation and battle execution are both very important, but it's super worth it. Not only do I feel really accomplished, it's a game that plays like nothing I've ever experienced, and it's a story I really learned to cherish. You're living in an MMO world, not the most unique premise nowadays, but one that Crosscode examines more than most media I've seen. The writer really thought about how people would act in this situation, with the clear distinction between characters who are playing a game, characters who actually live here, and characters who just exist as artificial NPCs to facilitate the game, but have their own fictitious storylines. There's a kind of huge find out how the universe was made, be a bunch of teenagers challenging the gods kind of story that you would see in a JRPG, and that's like the second most important storyline in this game. It uses this setting to explore themes of identity and what it means to be human, plus some subtle commentary on the state of the game's industry. And it's funny, and it's heartbreaking, and it's so, so good. I was afraid I was reaching a point in my life when I'd read too many stories and nothing could surprise me anymore, but so many games this year showed me there's still a lot of new stories to tell. And the DLC chapter is free. That's a great touch. Finally, it was December, and while I spent a lot of time either cooking for the holidays or being sick, my two pastimes, I managed to squeeze two last games in there. First, I decided to get back into the Shantae series with Half Genie Hero. I know, I'm really behind with this series. Long story short, Pirate's Curse is better, but this has a lot going for it too. The new art style is really nice, and bringing back the animal transformations from the first few games, they found a way to make it much more streamlined. I don't even mind the segmented nature of the story that much. The levels remind me a bit of Mega Man stages rather than real Metroidvania environments, so returning to them for collectibles and quest items can feel a bit unnatural. It all would have been okay if it came together in the end, which it sorta does. I think the script just needed more of a through line. Shantae mentions towards the end how she'd been feeling like her human half was a weakness when, in actuality, it's a strength. If we saw her struggling with that more in the Villain of the Day plot, and really overcoming it in the finale, this would have felt a lot more special. It's not their fault though, they just nailed it so well in the last game and now the series has higher standards to live up to. Those are big harem pants to fill. I'll still boot this game up from time to time, there's a lot of interesting DLC modes like the Risky Quest and the Friends to the End that I enjoyed. I'll get to Shantae 5 eventually too, I'm sure. Last but not least, I decided to cool down with Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time, which is a horrible game to cool down with. This game is actually incredibly frustrating, but it's a good kind of frustrating, for the most part at least when you're just playing stages beginning to end. The so-called Dark Souls of Platformers is back with a vengeance, and I appreciate its unrelenting difficulty, as opposed to Nintendo games that don't really get tough until after the credits roll. The level themes are interesting, the story has some good in-jokes for fans, and there's even some other playable characters. Can't say I love how these player characters are implemented. The way their levels work usually force you to replay half a regular crash level, which is kind of weird. I think it would have been better to just make these stages shorter. My favorite, to my own surprise, was Cortex, who takes on a more puzzle platforming style. Dingo Dial also is a fun power trip. Tana's not bad, but she's got what I like to call the lazy man's grappling hook and the lazy man's wall jump, where they only work in very particular places that make her feel clunky rather than agile. But what's even better are the quantum masks, giving Crash temporary abilities that complement the kind of platforming gameplay you've already been practicing. No annoying jetpacks or swimming stages, light on the vehicles, just good old-fashioned platforming. 
Just don't ask me to complete it. Screw that. I understand why some longtime fans are mad at the psychopathic lengths it takes to get everything. Crash games have always incentivized 100% completion, and the all-or-nothing approach to rewards makes it feel like you're missing out if you don't try. But say goodbye to your sanity if you do try. At first I thought I'd at least do my best on crate hunting as I went through these levels, but I was spending hours on levels not even getting close. And I found I was happier once I stopped caring about my crate count. I beat the game, no one can say I didn't. And that was my year. 50 games, 50 personal memories. I guess it's no surprise this video is so long. It felt good to finally play some of these games I've been wanting to get to for years without rushing through things just to get to the next game. I think I found a good balance here of being in the moment and keeping things moving, and I hope I can stick with that in the future. But I also want to make more videos this year, so we'll see. There was a real variety here. Some of my favorite genres like mystery games, tacticals, and platformers, but also a couple visual novels, a smattering of horror, and whatever Kuru 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 ran. Even if I had more bad to say about some games than good, I don't regret my time with any of these. Even in examining flaws, I find I'm learning more and more about the art form and more and more about myself with each title. And besides, there was a lot of good ones. If I had to pick the best games, I'd say these ones. If I had to pick the worst, these ones. Well, I've kept you long enough. Maybe I can do this again sometime, perhaps on a more frequent basis so these aren't hours long. Or do you prefer it as one big video? Let me know. Anyway, Happy New Year. May your 2024 be full of memorable experiences, electronic or otherwise. Hey friends, this is Post Editing Comic. Thanks for watching till the end. The video is essentially over now if you want to click off, but I got some calls to action if you want to hear me out. Sorry this didn't get out earlier this year, I'm a slow worker, but I'm really excited to see your thoughts. Likes on this video would be great, but what I'd love is for you to comment. Obviously I didn't have time to talk about each game specifically, but if you ask me literally anything about any of these games in the comments, I will probably answer you. Also, let me know if you have any cool takes about these games, or if you want to share what your favorite gaming experiences were last year. Lastly, I was doing most of this editing on my laptop, and for storage reasons, all of the footage I used was only 720p. I'm curious how many of you noticed, and if you did, whether it negatively impacted the video for you. If you have any thoughts, I'm all ears. Or eyes, I guess, because you'll be writing a comment. Seriously, though, it would mean so much to me to know it sparked anybody's brain. Cool, cool. Thanks, and have a good one.